Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong. I'm your humble host, V-Days. Today is February 7th, 2023. This is episode 76, where we will review The Restoration of the Priesthood, released in 1982. This has a running time of 20 minutes. It's unrated, and it's a religious drama. This review works best if you've seen this short before, though that is not required, and a spoiler alert. We're going to watch this film in totality together while I give you some insightful and occasionally irreverent commentary. How about a synopsis? The power to represent God in carrying out some of his most sacred work is given to men such as Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Aaron. John the Baptist uses authority when he baptized Jesus. Christ then converted upon his 12 apostles with Peter, James, and John holding the keys to this priesthood authority. Upon the passing of the apostles two millennia ago, there was a great apostasy and this authority was lost for many centuries. In the spring of 1829, Joseph Smith asks Oliver Cowdery to act as scribe as Joseph translates the writings of some ancient people in America that was written upon plates of gold. Coming upon a passage concerning baptism for the remission of sins, the two cousins pray to learn its meaning. John the Baptist appears and confers the priesthood of Aaron upon them. Using this authority, Joseph baptizes Oliver and then Oliver baptizes Joseph. They then repeat this order and ordain each other to what later became known as the Aaronic Priesthood. Peter, James, and John then appear to confer what later became known as the Melchizedek Priesthood. The Book of Mormon is published on March 26, 1830, and then on April 6th, Joseph and Oliver use their authority to organize the restored Church of Jesus Christ and ordain each other as elders of the Church, Joseph as first elder and Oliver as second. Let's cue it up! From the beginning of time, God has given certain men on earth power and authority to act for him and do his work. It's kind of funny that the narrator says from the beginning of time because, well, most scientists believe that humans have been on this planet for at least 200,000 years. And even LDS teachings specify that Adam was the first man to hold the holy priesthood. So apparently so, uh, God didn't give anyone authority for like, I don't know, 194,000 years. Also, the universe, it's been in existence for like 14 billion years. So it appears that God has only given man his power for a tiny, tiny fraction of that time. Not from the beginning of time, as the film claims. These men were chosen by God and ordained to his holy priesthood. The film says that God has given his power to certain men. Well, of course, that begs the question, what about women? What about Hulda in the Old Testament, for instance? Or what about Phoebe in the New Testament? In the National Press Club briefing in May of 2022, Apostle David A. Bednar spoke about why the church only gives priesthood to men. Let's check that out. Uh, you mentioned that women lead within the church in many ways. Uh, will there ever be a female president of the Church of Latter-day Saints? Can a woman be a prophet in the lineage of Joseph Smith? That's a great question. We follow the pattern of the ancient church. Uh, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands, by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. The pattern anciently was that the apostles were men. That, that's the pattern. Okay. So David A. Bednar says that the church is just following the pattern of Jesus in the scriptures. But Jesus called a number of women disciples in the scriptures too. Relying upon a book that was written 2,000 years ago can be really problematic. It'd be nice if David Bednar or his fellow apostles would go to the Lord and ask why women can't have the priesthood. But apparently God will not reveal his mind on this matter. And don't forget that God has given his power to certain men and for a certain period of time, only certain white men. So there's just never been a real reason as to why faithful LDS women can't hold the priesthood. And notice David A. Bednar does not say that we're waiting for a revelation for this or we've been fasting and praying over it. He hasn't even said that he's brought it up with God. It's really not a point that is uh, interesting to the current LDS leadership, I don't think. The ancient prophets such as Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Aaron were given this special priesthood authority the authority to act in the name of God. When you read what most Bible scholars have written about the subject, the idea of Adam holding the priesthood is really anachronistic. It's something that has been imposed upon the biblical text after the fact, because the first mention of priesthood in the Bible is not until Exodus chapter 40. Jesus Christ himself went to John to be baptized, where John held the priesthood authority to perform this holy ordinance. We learn in Luke that John the Baptist's father was a priest and therefore a Levite. LDS doctrine holds that John held the so-called Aaronic or Lesser Priesthood. The Savior chose 12 apostles and gave them the priesthood, which was necessary to perform their duties, saying, Ye have not chosen me, 
that I have chosen you and ordained you. Here the narrator is quoting from John chapter 15. Now the film is using this particular uh, account in the Bible of Jesus calling his disciples out of the Gospel of John because it more closely matches LDS doctrine. In earlier biblical accounts, we read that Jesus merely appointed the 12 disciples and the word ordain is absent. After his crucifixion, this priesthood authority remained with his apostles. Peter, James, and John had received the keys of the kingdom and became the head of Christ's church. There's a lot of scholarship, especially recent LDS scholarship through the church-backed Maxwell Institute, which seems to acknowledge that Jesus did not, in fact, establish a church. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, not upon this rock, I have built my church. The backyard professor, Carrie Schertz, covered this concept in a recent episode on Mormon discussions. Regarding the keys that we just heard about, we can read in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, quote, and also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you and confirmed you to be apostles and special witnesses of my name, and bear the keys of your ministry and of the same things which I revealed unto them, unto whom I have committed the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel for the last times and for the fullness of times, end quote. So the modern church believes that the current first presidency holds the keys of the priesthood. But in the Bible, we read that, the, that Jesus gave the keys to Peter alone. Again, Matthew chapter 16, quote, I will give unto you, meaning Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, end quote. Of course, there is no concept of a first presidency in the Bible. It's not even in the Book of Mormon. But following the death of the apostles, there was an apostasy. This priesthood authority was lost, and the world was in spiritual darkness and confusion. Many different churches were created, each interpreting the scriptures and performing ordinances according to their own understanding, but without priesthood authority. There was an interesting recent episode of Mormonism Live entitled, Whatever Happened to the Great Apostasy, which attempts to demonstrate that the modern Elias Church is moving away from the idea of a great apostasy. The Salt Lake Tribune recently published a book review entitled, Ancient Christians, an Introduction for Latter-day Saints, which was published by the Maxwell Institute. Both the book and the Tribune article make note that what Latter-day Saints believed about early Christianity and the so-called great apostasy perpetuates, quote, an overly simplistic, if not completely false narrative, end quote. Then in 1820, a 14-year-old boy, Joseph Smith, went to a grove of trees alone so that he might ask God which of all the many churches was right. An 1820 date for the first vision, also known as the Grove Experience, is seriously in question. Now, in the 1832 version of the first vision penned uh, by Joseph Smith's own hand, the young boy does not ask which of all the churches was right. Instead, Joseph was asking for a remission of sins. His humble prayer was answered with a wonderful vision. God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph and told him that the Church of Jesus Christ was not on the earth, but would be restored through him at a future time. So the film here is showing two angelic uh, persons. But again, going back to the 1832 account, that only discusses the Lord. There's not two persons. It mentions the Lord and no one else. In the 1835 version that Joseph gave, we do have two beings. However, they seemingly appear one after the other. Now, it's not until the 1838 and 1842 uh, Grove experiences where we get anything that matches what this film is trying to show. The filmmakers here are relying heavily on the so-called official version of Joseph Smith's first vision, which was finally canonized into the Pearl of Great Price in 1880. As part of this restoration, a heavenly messenger delivered to Joseph ancient writings engraved on metal plates. The film does not name this angelic messenger, and there is serious confusion in a number of early church sources about whether this messenger was Moroni or Nephi, though the church now teaches that this treasure guardian spirit was named Moroni. They contain the teachings of the Savior to the early inhabitants of the Americas. The Book of Mormon was translated from these plates. Sorry to interrupt so much, but this is a very important video. <laughs> According to Joseph Smith contemporary Willard Chase and at least one other early Mormon source, when Joseph went to retrieve the plates uh, for the final time in September of 1827 from the Hill Cumorah, he was dressed in all black clothes. He rode a black horse with a switched tail. And Joseph Smith got the plates at night, not in midday as we see here. That's all missing from this film. Like I said, Willard Chase and Benjamin Saunders both said that there was something like a toad guarding the plates, which does not make its appearance into the movie, nor does Joseph Smith getting knocked back 50 feet when he tried to remove the plates. The Book of Mormon and the Bible stand together as witnesses that Jesus is the Christ. All of the mystical elements are missing. Joseph Smith's occult worldview and his magical mindset, they've been excised to conform with decidedly modern sensibilities. 
This is the story of the restoration of God's sacred priesthood authority and the return of the Church of Jesus Christ to the earth. Now, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at mormonmoviereviews at gmail.com. This is an official church video under the direction of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles. That is the highest level of authority that a church film can have. Now, we are listening currently to an LDS hymn from the 1985 hymnal, High on a Mountain Top, one of my favorite hymns. We're about to land in the 5th of April, 1829. Here, Joseph is married to Emma Hale Smith. They've been living in Emma's father's home, or at least on his farm, uh, Isaac Hale, for about six months. Harmony, Pennsylvania is about 150 miles from the Hill Camorra. Now, this scene is set after Joseph Smith lost the original manuscript that he translated mostly with the help of Martin Harris. Now, we're showing the foolscap paper here. That's very accurate. It's called foolscap uh, because uh, in the 18th century, folio-sized paper had a watermark of a fool's cap on it. In the spring of 1829, Joseph and his wife Emma welcomed to their home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, a school teacher by the name of Oliver Cowdery. He had been brought to Harmony by Joseph's brother Samuel because he was anxious to meet the prophet. After boarding for a short time with Joseph Smith's parents in Manchester or Palmyra, when Joseph Smith was not around, Oliver Cowdery was told about the golden plates by the Smith parents. Oliver then traveled to Harmony, Pennsylvania, which is about a three-day journey, to meet Joseph Smith in person. And may I remind you that Oliver Cowdery is the third cousin of Lucy Max Smith, Joseph Smith's mother. Joseph, who was at that time translating a portion of the Book of Mormon, needed someone to write what he translated. Joseph had obtained the plates from an angel of the Lord. They contain the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm always a bit perplexed by the claim that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it doesn't contain any of the following. That God has a body of flesh and bones, that God is an exalted man, that God is the product of eternal progression, that God organized the world rather than created it, that men can become gods, that intelligences are eternal, there's no eternal marriage, there's no three degrees of glory, there's no mother in heaven, there are no temple endowment ordinances or ceilings or anything along those lines. And very importantly for this particular video, there's no Melchizedek priesthood containing uh, offices of elder, 70 high priest, and there's no Aaronic priesthood cons uh, consisting of offices of deacon, teacher, priest. There's not even Levitical priesthood in the Book of Mormon. The functions of the offices of evangelist, bishop, stake presidents, assistants to the 12, first presidency, president of the church, all of those are absent. When Oliver Cowdery asked how he could be of service to Joseph Smith, Joseph replied that he would like him to write what he, Joseph, translated. Oliver became convinced of the truthfulness and importance of Joseph's work and agreed to help him. The importance of Oliver Cowdery to the early church simply cannot be overestimated. The rate of dictation picked up significantly with Oliver's help. I speculate that it may have taken years to complete the Book of Mormon translation without the help of Oliver Cowdery. While translating the ancient writings, Joseph found mention of baptism for the remission of sins by one holding authority. It was clear that baptism was necessary, but it was also clear that baptism must be performed by someone holding the proper authority. Because they wanted to understand more about this important ordinance, he and Oliver decided to pray to the Lord. Now, the film is showing us a typical translation scene from movies of this era and echoes the vast majority of church artwork depicting the first two elders' efforts. The scene is highly anachronistic. Many sources indicate that not only were the plates not out in the open like we see in this scene, that the plates, they weren't even in the same room, maybe not even in the same house. The film shows a small curtain separating the two men on the tabletop. Now, there are differing accounts related to whether there was a curtain or not. I am of the opinion that more witnesses than not said that there was no curtain used in the translation of the Book of Mormon, and that's from eyewitnesses. Notice that we do not have the stone in the hat here. There's no oversized spectacles, which some believe were later named the Yerman Bellum. There's no breastplate. This scene is just so inaccurate in so many ways. I disagree with the narrator that the Book of Mormon teaches that baptism must be done by someone having authority. That is imposing on the text something that just isn't there because the idea of needing authority for baptism was not developed until after the Book of Mormon's printing in at least March of 1830. I'll share this uh, section right here that talks about Book of Mormon baptism from Craig James Osler, and uh, this was published by BYU Religious Study Center. It says, the Book of Mormon clarifies the doctrine of baptism taught in the New Testament. It teaches that baptism was required and practiced before Christ's ministry, and that after repentance and baptism by water comes a baptism by fire and the cleansing and sanctification of the Holy Ghost. You will note that the Book of Mormon really makes no claims about needing authority for baptism.
Nice musical scoring here. Really beautiful music to go along with this. Nice cinematography, great lighting, really a, a beautiful scene. While they were praying and calling upon the Lord, a messenger from heaven descended in a cloud of light. The messenger told them that he was their fellow servant. He said his name was John. The same person was called John the Baptist in the New Testament. And laying his hands upon the heads of Joseph and Oliver, he ordained them, saying, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. So the film is taking this particular account from what is now Doctrine and Covenants section 13. So again, we're near Harmony, Pennsylvania. We're on the banks of the Susquehanna River here. So much more is known about the Aaronic priesthood ordination than the Melchizedek priesthood ordination, which would be dated later. He said this Aaronic priesthood did not have the power of laying out of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but that this should be given to them at a later time. He said that he acted under the direction of Peter, James, and John, who held the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood. He said that the Melchizedek priesthood would be conferred on them at a later time and that Joseph should be the first elder of the church, and Oliver Cowdery the second. This is one of the most troubling sections of the film. Authority in the early church was really inherent in the office that a person held, namely the office of elder, or even the office of apostle. It was not until later that the idea of priesthood being separate from ordained office really came about. We don't get two priesthoods in the church until at least 1831, where the concept of a high priesthood is introduced. And we definitely don't get the idea of an Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood division until after Joseph Smith met Sidney Rigdon a number of years later. He commanded them to go and be baptized and gave them directions that Joseph should baptize Oliver Cowdery and afterwards Oliver should baptize Joseph. Joseph baptized Oliver, saying, Oliver Cowdery, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So this has always been a big question for me. How can one receive the priesthood if they haven't even been baptized yet? Because the modern church teaches that no one can receive the priesthood if they're not a member and have been confirmed. So the order here is confusing and backwards. Then baptized Joseph, saying, Joseph Smith, Jr., having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. After they received authority from John the Baptist, and after they had baptized each other for the remission of their sins, Joseph and Oliver then ordained each other to the Aaronic priesthood, as they had been commanded to do. Here's a more accurate picture of what actually happened. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. The restoration of the priesthood authority to the earth had begun. Joseph and Oliver now held the Aaronic priesthood, which authorized them to baptize in the name of the Savior for the remission of sins. LDS historian and scholar Richard Bushman acknowledged some difficulties with this particular narrative in Rough Stone Rolling, wherein he wrote, quote, summarizing the key events in his religious life in an 1830 statement, David Whitmer mentioned translation but said nothing about the restoration of the priesthood or the visit of an angel. The first compilation of Revelations in 1833 also omitted an account of John the Baptist. David Whitmer later told an interviewer he had heard nothing of John the Baptist until four years after the church's organization. Not until writing in his 1832 history did Joseph include even the reception of the Holy Priesthood by the ministering of angels to administer to the letter of the gospel among the cardinal events of his history. A glancing reference at best. The late appearance of these accounts raises the possibility of later fabrication. They continued their work of translation and patiently waited to be given the higher, 
or Melchizedek priesthood. Now, this is very anachronistic, both the setting here and the idea that the first and second elders were waiting for a higher priesthood at this time. There is simply no mention during contemporary accounts of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery waiting around for a higher priesthood during the process of dictating the Book of Mormon, period. This sacred event took place on the banks of the Susquehanna River. Acting under the direction of Jesus Christ, Peter, James, and John gave them the Melchizedek priesthood and ordained them to be apostles, special witnesses to the Savior. Uh, actually, more accurate would be special witnesses to the name of the Savior. Now, no date is ever given for this event. We don't really even have a location. If you want to try and date it, then I guess you could try. It'd be somewhere in between May 1829 and April 3rd, 1830. Now, Peter and James are apparently resurrected beings here, so they have bodies. But John the Revelator, remember, he was he was permitted to tarry in the flesh. So Jim Bennett kind of sarcastically jokes that he must have come to this ordination event in a canoe. Now, fun fact, angelic messengers like Peter, James, and John here have facial hair during this period of church films and in the temple endowment during this time. But beginning in 1990s, all of these folks would be portrayed by clean, shaven actors. Uh, so now we're in June 1829. Joseph Smith is portrayed as a hardworking, red-blooded American young man. He is not at all involved with treasure hunting, peep stones, or the occult. No, sir, those are just anti-Mormon lies. By the way, this is a reconstructed Whitmer home, not the original. Because of increasing persecution in Harmony, Pennsylvania, Joseph and Oliver continued the translation of the Book of Mormon in the home of Peter Whitmer in Fayette, New York. It was here that Joseph and Oliver, aided by their friend and assistant David Whitmer, completed the task of translating the Book of Mormon and prepared the manuscript for the printer. Now here, this is the Grandin Print Shop on Main Street in Palmyra, New York. Martin Harris mortgaged a large portion of his farm as $3,000 in collateral in order to guarantee the first 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon for printing. Now, Joseph Smith and uh, others tried to recoup that money by selling that first edition for, I want to say, I think it was a buck and a half a piece. Maybe it was $1.25. But their hearts really weren't in selling the book, which literally cost Martin Harris most of his farm. The publication of the Book of Mormon increased Joseph's desire to use the priesthood authority he had been given to organize the Church of Jesus Christ. Joseph and Oliver had for some time made this matter a subject of humble prayer. They were told to wait until those baptized could assemble to give their common consent to the proceedings and accept Oliver and Joseph as their spiritual teachers. To my knowledge, there's no mention of needing priesthood authority to organize the Church of Christ in 1830. Again, I would argue that that claim is anachronistic and or backdated. Joseph prayed and asked to know God's will concerning the church they were to establish. Then in the spring of 1830, Joseph received important instructions from the Lord concerning the manner in which the church was to be organized. Joseph was also told on which date the meeting to organize the church was to be held. So Joseph Smith here, he is shown writing his own revelation. That would be quite rare. Joseph Smith typically used scribes for dictation purposes. Now, I guess there he was writing Doctrine and Covenants section 20, the Articles and Covenants of the Church, which would be considered basically the founding document of the church. That document has been revised several times after it was initially written down. Doctrine and Covenants section 20 really relies heavily on the language of the Book of Mormon. And it is one of the few uh, sections of the Doctrine and Covenants that is not written in the first person of uh, Jehovah. Here we have the about 50 to 70 members who are present in the uh, Whitmer home on the day that the church was first organized. After greeting the people who had gathered together, Joseph told them that the Lord had set the date of April 6th, 1830, to organize the Church of Jesus Christ. Well, section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenant says that the name of the church will be the Church of Christ, not the Church of Jesus Christ, as the narrator claims. Perhaps that's a major victory for Satan. The meeting began with reverent prayer. And the gathered brethren were then asked to accept Joseph and Oliver by unanimous consent as their spiritual leaders. So the narrator is referencing the so-called law of common consent, which is touched upon in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, but is more fully expounded upon in Doctrine and Covenants section 26. They were also asked to agree to the organization of the church as it had been revealed to Joseph. Now, I believe that at this time only men could participate in the law of common consent.
Then Joseph laid his hands upon Oliver Cowdery's head and ordained him an elder of the church. Notice the narrator says nothing about Aaronic priesthood or Melchizedek priesthood because that's really not a concept at this time. At least it's not a concept that is discussed openly. After which Oliver ordained Joseph an elder of the church. Obedience to the laws of the state of New York, the church was organized with six original members. During that day, those who had previously been baptized for the remission of sins were rebaptized to become members of Christ's church. And later, many others were baptized, including Joseph's mother and father. Those who had been baptized were confirmed members of the newly organized church, and the gift of the Holy Ghost was given to them. Then, acting under the guidance of the Spirit, Joseph and Oliver ordained a number of brethren to various offices of the priesthood. Notice, he doesn't mention Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood again during this time, because there's no concept of those at this particular time. Early church ordination, it was really not based off of automatic ages like we have it in the church today, which started, I don't know, around 1900. While the members of the church were still gathered, a revelation was received in which the Lord said to the prophet Joseph, Behold, there shall be a record kept among you, and in it thou shalt be called a seer, a translator, a prophet, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an elder of the church. So we're quoting here from Doctrine and Covenants section 21. And speaking to the members of the church about their prophet, the Lord said, Thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments which he shall give unto you, his word ye shall receive, as if from my own mouth. Praise God. So we're hearing from the doxology here. Of course, early early LDS hymns were borrowed uh, significantly from the Protestant tradition. Joseph knelt to bless the sacrament, saying, That they may eat in the remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. And Joseph and Oliver bless the sacrament which is given in remembrance of the Savior. After partaking themselves, they passed it to the congregation. The Lord's Spirit was given to them abundantly. Yeah, so the sacramental prayers are, are uh, found in the Book of Mormon. Now, this film is only showing the breaking of the bread and the prayer over the bread and not the wine, nor its accompanying prayer, probably because the modern church has a strong prohibition against alcohol consumption, thanks to church leaders like Heber J. Grant in the 1920s. <laughs> What's in that cup? I want to see a close-up. What's in there? Hmm. We'll never know. Oliver then knelt to bless the sacrament, ending with the words that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. Oh, sorry. Is that Emma? Peter Whitmer?
they ended the events of that day with the happy knowledge that each person was now a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Actually, the Church of Christ. The Church had been organized according to the commandments and revelations given by Jesus Christ in these last days, as well as according to the order of the Church as written about in the New Testament. And so today, this same priesthood authority continues. The film is trying to show a direct line from Jesus to Peter, James, and John to the modern church. Now, there's no succession crisis that we're going to talk about after when Joseph Smith died that a number of people made claim to his keys and to his authority. No church film ever that I'm really aware of ever references the RLDS church or the FLDS church or any other branches of the restoration. There's just one pipeline and it's the all you ever need to think about priesthood has been given to millions of worthy men so they can do the work of God in his kingdom, in the church, in the home, and in the world to bless and enrich the lives of all mankind. Now, the timing of the release of this film is noteworthy. Remember, it is 1982. We're just a few years after the so-called Grace Temple and Priesthood ban that uh, made it impossible for persons of African descent to receive the priesthood. So now, the church can produce videos like this where it says that the priesthood can go to all mankind. These priesthood holders follow the commandment given by the Savior when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And there you have it, folks, the restoration of the priesthood. And by the way, at the end of the film, the narrator is referencing the so-called Great Commission that Jesus charged his, his disciples with at the end of his ministry, which is recorded in a number of the Gospels. David Whitmer was absolutely integral to the early events of the church, including helping Joseph and Emma come to Fayette in order to complete the translation. He was one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon and is a imp very important early figure. He said regarding the uh, priesthood restoration that, quote, I had never heard that an angel had ordained Joseph and Oliver to the Aaronic priesthood until the year 1834, 1835, or even 1836 in Ohio. I do not believe that John the Baptist ever ordained Joseph and Oliver. The film is really attempting to paint one cohesive narrative from the very beginning of 1820 all the way up through until I don't know, 1838, that the priesthood had been, you know, spoken of, talked about, Aaronic priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood. There's no doubts that the, the film doesn't talk about any of the controversies that surround it. It whitewashes everything. It promotes a faith-promoting narrative, and it does not get into the difficulties that this uh, priesthood restoration really is all about. It took me really two weeks to truly try to research this particular film review, and I was really loath to do it because I didn't think I was qualified to do it and because it is so difficult. And even now, I don't have all the ins and outs of the priesthood restoration. And part of the reason is, is because of misleading films like this and church materials, which really only paint one side of the issue and don't tell you what you don't know. It's very confusing and it's pretty muddled. And, the, uh, and this film does nothing to help anyone who really wants to understand the restoration of the priesthood. This film does nothing to help you grapple with this uh, very uh, confusing time. Now, thanks so much for joining me to review this film. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. And join us next time for another episode of the Mormon Movie Reviews, where LDS movie lovers belong, where we will review Passage to Zarahemla. So long.